What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Heights Podcast. We got a special guest on, not a typical guest that that we have on this podcast. Normally, we have on just a bunch of Catholics talking <laughs> about dating and relationships and identity. But today, we have on Anthony Kassar. He was, and, and, and maybe you'd still say you're a wrestler, mm -hmm. but he won the 2019, right? NCAA, you, yeah, you're a champion. Mm -hmm. And heavyweight yep okay and and you did mma for a little bit now you're doing some real estate so we're excited to have him on we're going to talk about his success in wrestling what it means to be a man he's, he's married he's got a he's got a wife and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well so anthony thanks for coming on um maybe just share with everyone a little bit of your journey um whether it be with faith with sport, take it however you want with just the man that you are today. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, first, I appreciate you having me on. I, I watch some of the episodes and stuff on social media, and it looks like you guys are doing some some good, impactful stuff. So I appreciate it. And yeah, quick quick summary about me. I come from a big family, a one of seven, three brothers, three sisters. My father was an Orthodox priest growing up, so faith was always yeah a big a big part of our lives. And I wanted to be like him, you know, you know, as a, as a son of his, wanted to be like his dad, his dad. And he was obviously very active in the church. And so I was always with him as an altar boy and, you know, visiting the sick, going to church, serving this and that. And I loved it uh, growing up and uh, took to wrestling pretty early again, because my father wrestled and, uh, and then, uh, you know, progressed over the years, middle school to high school, always had some natural talent with it, but didn't really start diving 100% into the sport until about halfway through high school. So I was kind of a late bloomer there. And then just put everything into it, set a goal to become a state champion and achieved that goal my senior year, set a new goal to become a national champion, took me another five years uh, at Penn State University to achieve that goal. Um, but through that all, I had you know ups and downs in, in life, in my faith, but ultimately, and then I fought this last, this last year and a half, had two fights, uh, retired 2-0, and, um, and through that all, I, you know, I feel like God has been forming me into the man that he wants me to be. I'm not anywhere close to it yet, but uh, he's definitely done a lot of great work over that journey with faith and wrestling and family and everything that's got into the, to that process. Yeah, cool. Were you, I mean, you know, your dad's Orthodox priest, you're, you're an altar boy. Mm -hmm. Were, was it just like, yeah, I'm always into the faith or was it like in high school, college where you're just like, why am I believing what I'm believing? Like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Did you ever kind of get into like the double life? Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Orthodox cause I just, that's just my family and mm -hmm. I think it's true, but I don't really know if I want to live it. Did you ever have like that? kind of questioning of faith? A little bit. So I was the first person in my family to go away to college. You know, my parents wanted to keep us close and keep that that solid moral culture, which I think is smart, especially now going through college and the temptations that arise. It's probably something I'm going to try to do with my kids. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, we couldn't pass up the wrestling opportunity. And so I had that, I would say, a little bit my freshman, maybe even sophomore year of college where you know, I was on my own and uh, had access to a lot of different temptations and partying and this and that. Uh, my faith was always there, but it definitely took a downturn around that time as to, you know, I never missed a uh, Sunday service growing up ever. You know, I would miss all the, tor the tournaments and all the events to make sure I was in church on Sunday mornings. And there was a couple Sundays that, you know, I, I, I found myself not not showing up to church. And so that was that conscious was always with me to where I knew that I wanted to be in church and I knew I should be in church uh, or I you know shouldn't be going out on Saturday nights till you know late in the morning or whatever it was. I, I always knew where my foundation lo uh, lied and where I wanted to be, but there was definitely some straying around that time to where I had to lock in, you know, I don't know, a year or two into that uh, where I was, you know, not doing anything crazy, but not living the life that, uh, you know, I, uh, an Orthodox Christian or a Christian in general uh, should be living to a T. 
And so I, I just kind of realized that in myself and said, you know, let's get back to, to committing myself to the faith and, you know, prayer, fasting, going to church and, and doing all these things that I know give me true meaning and purpose and peace. And um, from there, it's just been a, you know, co consistent buildup. Um, but that was definitely my transition period. Cool. So I, I was looking, I'll just, obviously I'm interviewing you, so I got to mm -hmm. research a little bit about you and, mm -hmm. uh, and all that. So who, the guy you beat, mm -hmm. you know, when you won the NCAA championship, like mm -hmm. you were supposedly like, you're the underdog, like yeah. mm -hmm. this guy's going to win, you know, most mm -hmm. people are probably thinking. So like what, what inspired you to, like, I want to win an NCAA championship. Like I want to beat this guy. And what, what was his name? Who you, who you ultimately beat? I beat a guy named Derek White in the finals, but uh, I beat a, a kid named Gable Stevenson who ended up winning the Olympic gold medal the following year. So, okay. He, yeah. So <laughs> either one of those. <laughs> that's, that's cool. That's, yeah. that's cool. And like, I can't even imagine like the moment of just being a champion. Mm -hmm. What inspired your work ethic? Where, where was your identity in all this? You know, I, I have a lot of friends who are athletes. You remind me of uh, one of my friends is he's on the Seattle Seahawks, Abraham Lucas. He's the right tackle, but nice. Like he's strong Catholic Christian man. Uh, but we talked a lot about where he was putting his identity in his mm -hmm. sport, in his faith, in parties and academics, whatever it might be your journey. I mean, I mean, you're an NCAA champion. That, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's big stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and you're trying to be a good Orthodox Christian. Where was your identity in all of this? Was it like my identity is in my sports? And if so, Maybe what was that like and what were the struggles with that? Maybe it wasn't and you're just like, what gave you the grit, the motivation that you have to work to ultimately win it? You know, mm -hmm. like, what inspired you? Was it just, oh, I just want to be a champion and just say like, I'm on top of the world? Mm -hmm. You know, like why, I guess. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. And I've thought about that, uh, you know, years passing from those big moments. And I think... Honestly, looking back, it, it was a combination of two things. One, to become the absolute best with the talents and gifts that God has blessed me, and then to give that glory back to him uh, by getting that spotlight and attention and trying to be a witness to faith to, to him and, and what he's blessed me with and what he's blessed all of us with. And the other side of it, which I didn't acknowledge as much at the time, was I just wanted everyone to see me. I wanted to be, I wanted to stand out and I wanted to be the man. And, um, you know, I, I created my nickname Ant the champ from high school and I did everything I could to make that a reality. And so I, I like I said, I think it was a combination of both to where there was some, there was some ego and some pride there where I, I wanted everyone to acknowledge who I said I was and, the goal that I kept on the forefront of my mind to, I guess, kind of balance that out was if I do that, I can be a really good witness to faith through it. So, you know, take that as it is. It, yep. There was some of both, but I, I, I did my best to, to use it for good. Yeah. Do you have, do you have any like examples of how you were giving glory to God in the midst of your success mm -hmm. that, impacted whether it's family or friends or strangers mm -hmm. uh, do you have like any any examples of that i know i'm putting you on the spot but no it's all no i like it i think the, the way i the way i conducted myself you know i wasn't even in i mean there's so many things but like interviews like i, I would always mention god uh, you know i wouldn't use foul language i would always represent represent myself uh with character and uh, I would make my cross before each match, like little things I would just try to sneak in there to so people can see and notice and be like, oh, maybe this guy, there's more to this guy than I actually thought. You know, social media, you know, make, making sure that I'm always giving glory to God first, um, you know, showing that I'm going to church, that faith is important to me, uh, not representing myself in a worldly, uh, you know, just egotistical and, 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 the usual thing you see from a successful athlete. I wasn't perfect. I still felt very confident, but I did my best to try to keep it through the lens of you're, you're a Christian first and a servant of God first. 
And then I hoped that through me setting a, an unrealistic and outlandish goal and putting everything into achieving it, that I, I hope that my family and friends and I've gotten feedback from them that, you know, they drew inspiration from that and realized that, you know, we can we can use what God has blessed us with to put wholeheartedly into a journey to achieve something and then uh, have a positive impact through it. So just little things that I would try to do throughout my career that that's helped me stand out. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for your witness. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the movie Creed. I'm thinking of the movie Rocky Balboa right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is, you know, it's, we see it depicted a lot of movies of this and it's just life in general where we struggle, we fight, we're fighting for something. We hit a wall where we feel like all hope's done. Like I can't push through, I can't do it. And then, you know, in the movie like Creed or Rocky, they come to a point, I'm thinking of Creed, he goes down in the water. I don't know if this is Creed too. Mm -hmm. And like, there was this moment where his mom like said to his like girlfriend or fiance or wife at the time, like, you just got to let him deal with what he's going through. And he goes down the water and like starts screaming, mm -hmm. he comes up and then the instrumental music starts pumping. He starts working hard and he pushes through whatever wall that might be in his life and is successful. I mean, it's, you know, death and resurrection. In yeah. these movies. Did you have that in your I mean, I think we all do in some mm -hmm. degree where let's just take wrestling and being an NCAA champion. Maybe that's your, like what you're most proud of in your wrestling career. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment in college where whether it's the evil one whispering lies, friends of like, you're not enough, you can't do this. Like mm -hmm. you're weak. You're never going to be a champion. Was there anything like that? Maybe it was faith. Maybe it was within family, a struggle, a battle but you pushed through it mm -hmm. and it led you to this success. And, and if so, if, if that was the case, what was it that made you push through to, no, I'm going to be on top. I'm, I'm going to be champion. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can <laughs> literally write a book on what, 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 what those adversities were that I went through and a, 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 anything from, Financial difficulty, you know, I had to take a year off from college because I, we had no money to pay for school and I hadn't earned a scholarship yet to physical injury. I had four shoulder surgeries on the same on the same shoulder to uh, difficulty even making the starting lineup. I had lost to one of my best friends and uh, Penn State was like it still is like three or four deep at each weight class to where any one of those guys can be an NCAA champion and you have to fight for a single spot to go compete at the tournament to family stuff. You know, my parents going through divorce, uh, just like so, so much adversity from college through from high school through college that now I can appreciate. And I feel like part of my story and what I try to do when I go to teach kids at clinics and camps and, and, uh, you know, speaking events is there's there's not much adversity that I didn't face throughout the process of achieving my goal that now I feel like I have a testimony to help kids and, and people feel like they can relate when they're going through something very difficult. And it seems like the task at, at hand is impossible. And the way that you asked how I got through that is I started to look at each trial as a path to where I wanted to go and who I wanted to become rather than a roadblock that couldn't be pushed through. You know, there's a book called The Obstacle is the Way and it kind of sums up my mentality during that time is, okay, this happened. So where's the benefit in it? What's God trying to teach me? Maybe it's for my sport. Maybe it's for my personal life. Maybe it's for my faith, but there's something in it that he is allowing to uh, help me improve and get better. And I started to also look at it like this can be the reason why I don't achieve my goal or it can be the, re the exact reason that I do. And now looking back, I can thankfully say that those are the reason, you know, losing the starting spot uh, the, the year before I won nationals, you know, reignited the fire in me. And I went up to the next weight class. I put on 40 pounds in six months and, uh, you know, won the heavyweight division you know, getting surgery multiple times to where I had to take a break from the sport and appreciate it so much more 
and focus on other things to benefit me other than just training, you know, visualization and nutrition and uh, taking care of myself and all those things and family stuff that put a chip on my shoulder and, and you know, for right or wrong, forced me to want to stand out. And so all these things that I just kept that goal in my mind of whether it was being a state champion or an NCAA champion, for whatever reason, that's what God placed on my heart. And I, I kept that image in my mind and self-belief in, in what I was shooting out to accomplish at all times that I just decided nothing was going to stop me from getting from point A to point B. And once that decision is made, you know, you can get through anything. It's when you say you want something, but you're like, yeah, I, w- I would like to be an NCAA champion or I would like to get this new job. Or I'd like to, f- I would like to have a good marriage. Then, then the things can pop up that are detrimental immediately. But if you say I'm making this decision and writing this down, that this is what I'm going to shoot after. Maybe it's in God's plan. Maybe it's not, but I'm going to do everything I possibly can to make it a reality. Then, then everything else becomes a little more minuscule. Yeah, I think kind of what you mentioned so often, we like, we set goals or like, oh, I'm going to do this. I, I'm, I'm not thinking of The Rock. I don't know if you, <laughs> but The Rock says like, there's, uh, you know, one day I'll do this. Mm-hmm. And then he like repeats himself or day one, mm-hmm. I start now, like one day or day one. Mm-hmm. And I think so often I can just think of it in my own life of like, you know, one day, I'll get this figured out one day. I'll get rid of this vice, you know, one day rather than no day one. Yeah. Like what, when you go around camps or, you know, talk to people who are pursuing any path towards success, like what's the one thing that you tell them? Like, how does, how does one get motivation to be successful to actually know? day one, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it now. Like, mm-hmm. do you have to like, go deep within yourself of like, why am I doing this? Like, who do I want to become? Like, what's my, what's the purpose of this? Mm-hmm. You know, like, what would you say to, to someone who, how do I get that motivation? I think, so my coach, my coach, one of my coaches at Penn state, coach Kale Sanderson, he, he's taught me a lot about success and life and faith and how to just become the best that you can be in all those areas. And one thing he likes to say is, you know, a lot of people need that big reason why to start. And I think that might be a reason why a lot of people don't start is trying to figure out what that reason and big driving force is when in reality, it can just be that you want it, that you want to. And I think that in itself is something that can come from God. If it's not something that's going to be negative, uh, have a negative impact on humanity, then maybe you just have a desire in your heart that God has placed there. Uh, And so I don't think I had this huge reason and plan to go out and win a title. It was just I saw someone do it. I saw what that was like. And I really loved wrestling. And it was something that I was naturally good at. And so those things combined, if you're naturally good at something and you're drawn to it and you see what the potential can be, that can be enough to just be like, okay, I'm going to, I want this now. And it's just being clear on that from the beginning. If what takes time is, is getting clear on it. If you're not clear on it, I wouldn't even start. If, if you're clear on, okay, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I want this and I want to pursue this then the motivation's there. And, and even, even when, even when it isn't there, you have that purpose of what it is, maybe not why, but you know what it is. Yeah. And that helped me stay focused. And uh, I, yeah, I, I wanted it. So. Yeah. So what was it like when you won? Was it everything you thought it would be like, okay, I've worked so hard for this moment uh because you know tom brady there's a famous interview on 60 minutes he's like why do i have three super bowl rings and i still think there's something greater out there for me he's like Mm -hmm. everyone tells me i I did it you know this is my dream but i'm thinking gosh like there's got to be more to life than this Mm -hmm. and the interviewee's like what's the answer or the interviewer is like what's the answer tom 
It's like, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. <laughs> and got to find faith. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But was it, I mean, you seem pretty free. I mean, you were able to, oh, I did MMA. I, what, I was 2-0. and oh, But I feel God is calling me to do something else. And you mm -hmm. seem pretty at peace and just like free with it. Mm -hmm. When you won, was it just like, awesome, this is great. But okay, now what's the next thing the Lord's inviting me to? You, you know, yeah. what was it like when you actually won? Well, it was, I mean, it was amazing. I, I put five years of, of hard work and dedication into pushing through all the adversity that I mentioned. And for something that, if you ask 99.9% .9 of the population said, Anthony Kassar would never be a starter on the Penn State wrestling team. Uh, ne you know, never, instead of uh, being an all American or a national champ, like that, that just wasn't in the question. Um, it, it wasn't on the table. And so the, once I achieved it and I had visualized it for so long, when you do that, it, it kind of feels like you've already been there in a way because you've, you, you've visualized and seen yourself staying on top of the podium and falling down to your knees and pointing up to God as a national champion over and over and over and over again, that when you get there, it's like, okay, yeah, this is normal. Like this is exactly like it was the last three years or whatever that I visual visualized it. But at the same time, it also felt like a thousand pound weight was lifted off my chest and that I, I achieved what only I knew I could. And so it was, it was definitely one of the best moments of my life. It, it probably got me, it, it definitely got me too high to a certain extent to where like I was too high on myself and too high on the moment that that lasted like, you know, a few months or whatever. And it was already on to the next thing, like a week later, it was already on to become an Olympic champion the, the, the next week. But I learned from that process that when I do achieve something big, I can't let myself get too high. And because then on the, on the flip side, when something bad happens, like I was qualifying for the Olympic trials and I broke my shoulder and the guy that I beat made the team and then won gold like that, that takes you down, down to the rock bottom because you were so high up from your previous achievement. Yeah. So I learned, I learned from that, that I have to stay at a middle ground regardless of what's happening in my life. Yeah. And so the answer to your question was, I can't lie. It was an amazing, amazing feeling, but part of me, you know, it felt normal and then it was right, right on to the next thing. Yeah. And yeah, I think it depends on like where you put your identity. So if you completely put your identity in wrestling, mm -hmm. okay, you break your shoulder, the guy who you just beat now he's gold champ. You can mm -hmm. easily just think like, who am I? Like, exactly. I don't know who I am. Uh, but you know, you're a man of faith and we, I mean, we all wrestle in our faith. Mm -hmm. And if, yeah, if we don't have something greater than our career or what our friend says about us, then that's going to affect who we think we are. And that exactly. can then just crumble. So let's kind yeah. of stick to faith, your faith and marriage and, you know, how you are viewing what you want life to be now. Mm -hmm. So just just tell me where, how long have you met, known your wife? Where, where did you meet her mm -hmm. and why did you choose her to be your mm -hmm. forever? We might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we met in 2014 at Penn state. She was on the track team. I was on the wrestling team and we had kind of a crazy story. We dated on and off throughout college. You know, I was hell bent on, on my focus and it was, you know, wrestling over everything. Um, I said my faith came first, then wrestling, but it, my wrestling definitely came before my personal relationships at the time. And so I had a lot of maturing to do and growing up to do. And we uh, ended up dating again after college. And then uh, I was pursuing my next goal and then MMA. And so it was like a lot of ups and downs and on and offs with our relationship. But then uh, about two years ago, um, we got I actually was was praying because I felt like I was at a point in my life where I wanted a wife and I wanted to commit to someone. I felt like I had done enough personal growth to where I can sustain a you know romantic long term relationship. 
And so I, I was really praying for that and searching for it. And God put um, Julie, my wife, back into my life right around that time. And I, so I, I continued to pray about it. I said, God, is this, is this what you want? Because we were always, uh, you know, we always had a very close, deep relationship. And I always saw her as my potential wife, but the, the growth just wasn't there yet. And so I felt clear that God was, was bringing her back in at the right time. And so it was pretty quick after that, that we started dating and then I proposed, then we got married uh, this past November. So we're almost a year in. And the reason why she's perfect for me is she's a woman of faith. Uh, she has a lot of the same, uh, you know, focuses on, on personal growth as I do. Um, just trying to be the best that she can be in mind, body, and spirit. She's you know, got a great heart. She's very loving and selfless. I know she's going to be a great mom. And it's just, you know, everything I can ask for. And really my perfect match in um, what I didn't know existed. And so I didn't have a lot of relationships, mainly because I was focused on my goals. And she was one of the only ones that I maintained that with throughout my career. And so now we're just on that journey of building that that foundation as a married couple. And it's been the most rewarding and growth filled process I could ask for. Cool. Mm -hmm. I, I watched a, a little interview clip where you said, and I don't know if this is what you're, what you're still thinking, but you said that you wanted a big family. Oh, yeah. So uh, how many how many kids? I come from seven. My dad's come from from seven. His dad comes from seven. So one of us have to continue it. Continue I'm hoping. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, that's good. Maybe you can beat it. Maybe eight, maybe nine. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm down. I, so yeah. uh, I, I was just recently at my 10 year high school reunion. Nice. And I told this guy I hadn't seen in a long time. Like, oh yeah, my my best friend Braden, he's got he's got two kids now, and this guy is like, like, whoa, 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 like he's only twenty eight, like is he gonna have like more kids? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, like I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in our culture, the idea of having seven kids, you're you're crazy, you're yeah. you're irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've had even people tell you that. Mm -hmm. Like, what what would you say to those people? I would say that we need more people like us repopulating the earth. So I think it's our duty and responsibility to create tribes of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of uh, you know, Christian children that have high moral character and are going to make a positive impact on the world. And from what I've been told from the people that I'm close to and look up to, there's nothing more rewarding and, and no better ministry than creating a holy family yeah maybe dude maybe you need to have like 12 kids maybe 15 yeah i, I really need to get going yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so i mean you're ncaa champion like you've had a lot of success my guess is you've had a lot of temptation come your way worldliness come your way like why stay keep your faith in christ like like why not ditch it and and just do what whatever you want whenever you want however you want like why are you orthodox christian it's mm -hmm. not like why are you and it, it, it's not just a label it seems like no this is this is a part of just who, deeply who i am and how i yeah. want my life how i want to raise my kids love my wife like everything i do it's like this is my the center of my life like like why yeah yeah i mean I get chills when you even ask that question. It's like, I, I just, there's nothing else that truly matters if it doesn't come off of that, you know, the sacrament of marriage, you know, kids, um, raising in a, in a Christian household and, and creating them through, you know, how God designed it. And, you know, my, my career, my relationships, like everything good in my life stems from my faith. And I don't think, just from my personal experience, you know, having tastes of, of the temptation and of doing, of having freedom and doing what you want is actually the most slave filled existence. And, ev and everybody knows that. And everybody who's had success will say that like Brady and, and you mentioned, and 
everybody, if you just watch and listen, you don't have to experience it for yourself because you're looking at people who have everything you could possibly want in, in this worldly existence. But why are they still unhappy? Why, why are they still committing suicide? Why are they still, you know, acting out? Why are they still addicted to substances and, um, you know, can't stick to, to one relationship? It's like, these are all signs of pain and, and searching for something that truly gives them peace and meaning and purpose and nothing, nothing in this earth will except for that relationship with God and, and your faith. And so when you ask me why, it's like I, w- I wouldn't have the motivation to do anything um, long term or find true meaning in my existence if it wasn't in, in, through the lens of, of being a, a child of God. Amen. Preach it. <laughs> that, I'm thinking the same thing. Yeah. If I wasn't Christian, what gives me purpose and meaning? Like, what would I do? Yeah. And so what was it like getting married within the Orthodox church? I, I saw some pictures, like you guys mm-hmm. are wearing crowns mm-hmm. and holding like a candle. Like, tell me about it. Tell me about the ceremony, the the rituals in it the meaning of the crowns and what it was like for the two of you to get married in the church. Yeah, it was awesome. So she, she grew up uh, Protestant and and converted right before we got married. So it was awesome to kind of be starting this, this journey on the same page. And the service is, is beautiful, you know, similar to very similar to a Roman Catholic wedding ceremony, uh, just some old age rituals uh, put in there that are, you know, based in the scripture. So, the the crowns are you know uh you know you're going to be the king and queen of of your kingdom and uh you know what what that's going to look like and that you're you're bonded together uh forever and your souls and your spirit and your and your flesh become one and so this is now your kingdom and uh you have to do your best to to run it in in a way that god runs his and um you know we do uh, the candles, um, we do, um, we, we actually added one in, we did a, a, a feet washing ceremony, which was really cool. Yeah. So we just, a sign of humility, you know, as Jesus washed his disciples feet, you know, just, just showing that sign of, of love and service from the beginning that we're not here to have our needs be met, but to try to serve the other person's needs before our own. And we do, you know, we do the rings, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting some, but it's a really deep and impactful service that, uh, even, even people that aren't, aren't Christian can appreciate because it just shows what, what marriage was designed for. And that is, you know, two broken, sinful people coming together to try to create a life, uh, and put God in the center of that life so that as they grow closer to each other, they grow closer to God. And to me, there's nothing more inspiring than seeing, you know, a happy, healthy Christian uh, marriage and then family coming off that. Yeah. So I don't know if you know this passage, but it's St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. He says, the one flesh union of man and woman is a great mystery Mm -hmm. that refers to Christ's love for his church. And as you said, it's, it's a sacrament. So, you know, a, a visible sign that causes divine grace, like your marriage now isn't just like this, like sign of God's love. It's a real participation in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that's kind of theology. I, you know, I got my master's in theology, but nice. is there, was there anything in the, the, the liturgy, the ceremony that where that was referenced, like the one flesh union is now a great mystery that refers to Christ love for his church. Was there anything of like, the vows that you said re- related to that in any way? Yeah. I'd have to go back, you know, on that day, you're like, as you know, you're all over the place. Yeah. Um, but for sure. I mean, that, that's the, the prime example. It, the par excellence is, is Jesus's relationship to the church as what we're shooting for and, and how he loved her, you know, unconditionally and with humility and, and service and so there was definitely references to that throughout the service. And we don't do our own vows. You know, there, there are vows that come directly from the scripture, just like you just mentioned, uh, of, of how, how are we vowing to love each other? Well, we're vowing to love each other 
to the best of our ability based off of how Christ loved the church. And that's the extent of, of the promise, um, you know, is can we shoot for that goal? And there's no other, in my, you know, in my opinion, there's no other vows that need to be said uh, other than that promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of one of my cousins, uh, not doesn't have a faith at all. And I, I wasn't at their marriage, which was out outside the church. I think it was just at an outdoor and this outdoor ceremony. And I saw them one day after they were quote unquote married. Mm -hmm. And I just asked like, Hey, like, like, what's it, what's it like, mm -hmm. you know, to be married. And they were, you know, living together before. And he just said like, Oh, like there's no difference. Yeah. That was his response. There, yeah. There's no difference. And I've been to a wedding, other weddings outside, just nothing to do with faith or Christ. And my experience of being at the wedding that it, it didn't, there wasn't a power there. There wasn't deep meaning or I didn't experience like a love like Christ loves, but mm -hmm. I've been to weddings in churches where the, you see the couple wants to love as Christ loves. And you see the symbolism of the crowns and the candles and the washing of feet. And it, your heart is just drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Like there's something beautiful here. Yeah. And I think that's just because we're made for that. We're, we're made for a love like Christ loves the church. Mm hmm you know, that's, is what we're made for. And it's honestly like, and I, I think you would say this too, like, I want to have the power and the strength to love as Christ loves. Yeah. So you're married now for a year. You're going to have a big family. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm calling 12. Well, <laughs> exactly, we've got 20 years to see it. Uh, but what is like, who's, who's the man, who's the husband, who is the father that you envision yourself and, I think with that answer, it will be an answer to the question of like, you know, like, how are you going to raise your kids? Mm -hmm. You know, even the boys, like who is the man that, that you want to instill in them? Or just even if any guy asks you like, Hey, Anthony, like you've been so successful in like wrestling, like now you're pursuing real estate, like you're a good, fa you're a faithful man. Like, what does it mean to be a good man? Like, mm -hmm. like, so, you know, what would you say? Who's the husband father that you want to be? Yeah, that's a powerful question. Uh, I think I've been focused on who's the husband that I want to be. And that's been its own journey. And I'm doing my best to get better because it's been a, even in the last, <laughs> even in the last nine months, like you, you just realize so much about yourself that you can't realize on your own. Like I, I thought I reached the pinnacle of self growth and improvement on my own. And then I got married and it was like, oh, here's 13 different weaknesses that you, yeah. you know you had just by relating to someone consistently on a daily basis. So that's been tough, but the most rewarding thing of just realizing how, how much I need to improve. And so now that, you know, we're, we're starting to uh, plan for a family, that's honestly a question that I'm going to start focusing on a lot more. And just off the bat right now, from what I've learned, what does it mean to be a good man is to put God first, first and foremost. I mean, everything that I could learn and teach about being a good man is right there in the holy book. And so as long as that comes first and everything is taken through that lens, I think you're going to be just fine. And, uh, th you know, through that, it's for me being a man of integrity, you know, knowing who you are and who you're not and sticking to that to the best that, that you possibly can, uh, being honest with yourself and others and having just true self-awareness of who you are and where you're at. And I think that comes from experience and time, but just having something to resort back to, um, to, you know, when life's throwing stuff at you and you're experiencing ups and downs, I think being a good man is doing your best to stick to that moral compass of, of who you say you are. And yeah, hopefully that translates into your relationship with obviously God and then yourself and then with others. 
and um, you know being the best that you can for those relationships and having that humility and selflessness to uh, you know put those put those before yourself but it's a question i'm going to be asking myself a lot in these coming months and uh, what i'm going to always resort back to is how does god say and how does his son say that a man should be yeah i think it's yeah it's a hard question to answer because it's so deep but Mm -hmm. like what you said it's christ is the icon of masculinity Mm -hmm. he's the icon of what it means to be a man so dive into the word enter into prayer with him lord Mm -hmm. help me to be conformed to you exactly a true man you know yeah for you and you know what your spouse deserves and what your kids deserve your Mm -hmm. family society um so sweet anthony that's it. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for coming on the Heist Podcast. I appreciate the conversation, your time. Of course, man. Love what you guys are doing. So, thanks for uh, including me. In it.